So this is our um, webinar number 21 since we started doing these webinars uh, about a year ago. And uh, today we're talking about fraud and scams. And if you're not interested in, in those topics, then um, you're probably on the wrong webinar. <laughs> So I'd like to introduce our, our panelists here first. Jane is the uh, chief deputy in the Denver District Attorney's Office and widely recognized as an expert in the field of elder financial exploitation, including, um, including an invitation to give a TED Talk. So I, I think um, you can probably read the rest of this faster than I can, but I think uh, it's important to notice that uh, Jane's been involved in elder abuse issues for a very long time and um, uh, primarily on the prosecutorial um, side and also in proposing legislation, um, some of which um, some of us have been involved in in the past. Um, our, our next presenter is Carrie Johnson. And uh, Carrie is, has been an active advocate for older Coloradans with a prime focus on communities against senior exploitation for quite some time. Um, Carrie goes around and, and talks to people about uh, these issues frequently. So um, primarily uh, works for the uh, Jefferson County um, District Attorney's Office. And he's going to be talking to us today about some ways to avoid getting scammed. And uh, our uh, next speaker is Jamie Sorrells. And Jamie is the Director of Consumer Fraud Protection, which is part of the Economic Crime Unit for the 18th Judicial District Attorney's Office, serving Arapahoe, Douglas, Albert, and Lincoln counties. So he assists those who have fallen victim to fraudulent events and conducts fraud and elder exploitation prevention seminars on a pretty regular basis. Uh, prior to joining the district attorney's office, he was vice president of marketing and sales operations with an international manufacturing company and with Bank of America. And, uh, and our final presenter is Mark uh, Federhoff, who is the program manager with AARP Elder Watch, which you may be familiar with, and has worked on education and outreach to older adults for over 15 years and works with a crew of dedicated volunteers to address thousands of inquiries, which is pretty sad by itself, thousands of inquiries each month about fraud, scams, and financial exploitation. A little bit uh, now about who AgeWise Colorado is. This will be very brief. Um, we are working very hard to be the premier information embedded resource hub for aging Coloradans and all current and future caregivers as well. You use this illustration to show um, very quickly, you know, who we're working with. We refer to these folks here in the middle as the sandwich generation. Uh, typically, that's the age of around, you know, between 40 and 60 or 65. Uh, these are the folks who are often called upon to become caregivers for um, older adults in their families and, uh, and friends. And then, but we also uh, very much um, want to attract uh, the older adults themselves to take a look at what we have on our, on our site. So we're all about serving uh, aging Coloradans, caregivers, as I mentioned, employers. Um, many employers have uh, a lot of people who are in that sandwich generation. And when those folks uh, find out that uh, there's a need for some help from them, um, can induce um, periods of stress. And so the reason that, in, that that stress occurs is because it's like, I don't know what to do and I don't know where to go. So we're providing people a, a safe place to come and learn about aging related issues and find the information they need and also to find actually vetted uh, service providers. And uh, these are uh, the service areas that we focus on. Um, they're pretty varied. Um, Obviously, what we're talking about today is kind of fits in areas of um, uh, protecting your financial situation and uh, keeping from getting scammed. And, uh, and then the abuse issue is, is, is another one all by itself. But <clears throat> we've had webinars um, on probably every one of these topics at one point in time over the last year. So I'm going to stop sharing here and uh, I'm going to ask Jane to start us off. Tell us what you do, Jane, and um, and what you're up to these days. 
Well, good good morning, everyone. And, and Bob, thank you for that introduction. And Barbara, also, thank you for the invite to be here. And uh, hello to all the, the folks out in the community who are, who are watching this morning. And hi to my uh, co-panelists um, and, and uh, certainly some scam experts here in our ranks today with um, Jamie and, and Kerry and also Mark are uh, going to give you some um, good information today and, and HYs uh, really obviously a, a hub for great information and providing this information to, to all of you. So my job is, um, as you heard, I'm a chief deputy. I run the elder and at risk unit in the city and county of Denver. And there are other units in, in DA's offices that doing very similar work to, to me. I think my, my two mantras are, um, it's it's not a civil issue and it's not about making bad choices um, because historically this kind of crime has been it's been underreported it's been underprosecuted but we've been making headway against that. Um, Carrie and I originally met in I think 2013 when uh, we started working on trying to get mandatory reporting introduced in Colorado and for anybody who doesn't know what I mean by mandatory reporting. Most folks now who work with aging populations fall into the category where if they have reasonable cause to believe that there's abuse, neglect or exploitation going on, they have to report to law enforcement within 24 hours, which is, is a pretty tight deadline. And then that information comes to us at the district attorney's office. It goes to adult protective service services. And that legislation, which um, was really um, pioneered also by Scott Story, the, the former DA in Jefferson County, the first judicial district has made a huge difference to um, the, the extent of joined upness, if that's such a word, in the state of Colorado. So um, we're happy to be working in this field. We do, in Denver, we do receive over 2000 mandatory reports per annum. So um, you can hear from that, that around the state, the numbers are getting pretty large and, and there's more of a light shone on this area than certainly than there was seven, 10 years ago even. So I want, I know that you're gonna get a lot of information about um, specific scams and frauds and, and ways to defeat those from my colleagues here. So I actually wanted to just um, give you a couple of very quick examples, but I'm going to leave the, the scam details to them. Um, and then I'm going to warn you about two types of crime that we see. Since I'm a prosecutor, I guess I'm coming at it from um, a slightly different angle. So those two cases will be to do with financial exploitation. So just to give you an example of how often we see these things, I, I waded through to, um, to extract some details of some of the reports that have come in this week, only this week into um, Denver District Attorney's Office. So this morning I had one where a senior has sent over $50,000 to a particular company, um, which does seem to have uh, an office, a real business office in, in California, so, so um, in Silicon Valley. So that's good news that at least that one might be trackable. I saw um, 13,000 going to scammers in gift cards and Bitcoin um, earlier this week by a lady who repeatedly went to her bank and then bought gift cards and bought Bitcoin. I saw a, a gentleman who had received calls from a person saying they were with Xfinity and were doing a promotion with Target. So that seems to be this week's um, specialty uh, flavor. And he had lost $1,484 before he realized that this was a scam. Another lady had unexpected withdrawals from her bank account. $11,895 had gone from her, um, it's actually a credit union, checking and savings account and from her credit card. So we can guess that her information had been compromised. And then um, I think we often say, oh, if you place the call, that's much safer than when somebody calls you. So I just wanted to throw in there that earlier this week, we had a, a woman who had contacted a number for YouTube TV after finding the number on a Google search. And uh, she had lost approximately $1,500 to, um, to that particular scam. And then we had, I, I know that we see a lot that are threatening. And we had a gentleman who was contacted by um, people purporting to be from Geek Squad. And he was threatened and then received a threatening message through his computer printer because they had taken control of his computer. So just a few examples of the horrible um, varieties of scams that are out there. Um, I wanted to ask you, Bob, if you could allow me to uh, share my screen for a, a couple minutes more.
So these won't be um, exhaustive figures. These are only our totals from our mandatory reports, which doesn't include a whole bunch of things that are being done out there by securities exchange, by the attorney general's office. But this is just an example of how great this problem is. So you will see that those figures have been climbing pretty rapidly. And in 2022, things are bad right out there so that in the even in one county city and county here in Denver which is both a rich and a poor county we're seeing a loss in the first quarter of between 1,600,000 and 1,800,000 so really um, what I would describe as ginormous figures there so my colleagues will be talking to you more about these scams but I'm going to go on go ahead here I hope and give you some details of a couple of exploitation things that I would like you to watch out for. So before we just start those, um, there has been a very big uh, survey just released about the extent of cognitive impairment and dementia in the USA. It's not pleasant or encouraging reading, but it does affect how people are victimized and how we see this, this happening. And the, um, the results of that are here that they surveyed about three and a half thousand people, 65 and older, and a, about one third had either dementia or mild cognitive impairment. So there are a lot of people who are not in the same place as they were perhaps 10 or 20 years ago, who might be more liable to fall for this type of ex financial exploitation. And I apologize, I'm kind of juggling my laptop and computer screen here, so I don't mean to make you seasick, but if it went up and down a few times there, I'll try and stop that. Okay, so property scam. You know, um, you guys may, if you are as old as I am and listen to KBCO, you may have heard these ads that say, you know, you got to watch out, someone's going to steal your most valuable asset here. They're actually going to record a deed and take your home. And, you know, I think when we hear these kind of ads, people may take this with a grain of salt, um, but uh, we did have exactly that sort of situation and we've had it uh, we've had it a few times in, in uh, the last couple of years where, in fact, a deed has been recorded and uh, without the, the knowledge of the person who's the owner of the property. And in fact, this was a case which we did prosecute where the, the uh, warranty deed was, was forged. It was notarized by this female. It was recorded by this male. And so without the knowledge of the homeowner, the title had been completely transferred out of her uh, out of her name. So this kind of crime is is pretty shocking. This actually came to our attention because another person who was a speculator had been looking at this property and I think they were they they saw that it the title had changed and perhaps they thought they they could have got a good deal on it, but they they were suspicious because the um the amount of the sale was so much um lower the purported sale was so much lower than the value of the property. So as part of the case, we rely a lot on digital evidence and, and cell phones were seized in this case. And uh, when those were, uh, as we would say, dumped and the information was extracted, the uh, male party who you saw there had been bragging about closing on this particular property and had, the, the person he was speaking to asked him for the address, he gave the, uh, the address, and lo and behold, it was of the property that um, that had been stolen. So um, there were civil proceedings going on um, for delinquency of um, certain charges by the city uh, and a receiver got involved, sold the house. I, I thought it was really interesting that by this time, the senior wouldn't even meet the receiver to collect the check for the sale of her property. She believed no one except perhaps the investigator from our office who eventually helped in brokering that, um, that type of exchange. So how can you protect, about, protect yourself from this? I think it's difficult, but just be aware of uh, mail, any random mail that you get or any diversion of mail that you learn about. You can also log in if you're concerned, you can log into the um, clerk and recorder's site to check on the chain of title. You can log in as a guest um, for free on that site. So that's one thing that you could do. So just be aware that this type of thing does happen. I would say it happens more when people maybe have moved out. Some people, this uh, particular lady had moved out and downsized, but hadn't sold her prior property. And so if a house, how starts to have um, 
taxes, or, as you know, or uh, delinquency notices due on it, then people start taking too much of an interest in it. So that's one thing that is a, a, an exploitation that we're seeing, which might be surprising to you. Another one that we see perhaps more frequently is power of attorney fraud. Now, everyone wants to get their affairs in order, um, and uh, sometimes that doesn't work out the way that they hope it's going to. So this is a gentleman whose family um, want us to use this case to educate the community. His name was Floyd. He had three kids. Um, he was diagnosed with a terminal illness. Um, I never got to meet him, but his family brought the case to our office a while after he passed away. And um, you will see that there are yellow and blue lines in that, that graph on the left. The, um, the sad thing is that he made his brother his agent under a power of attorney. The yellow um, was the money that was spent on his care, and the blue was the money that was stolen by his brother. Um, so his brother was prosecuted because theft uh, by a power of attorney is a criminal matter. It is not a civil matter. And um, that is something that was prosecuted and actually did go to a trial. So um, I just wanted to make you aware of that and um, just to reference very briefly the importance of planning your affairs and choosing the right person to be your power of attorney thinking and talking about whether you want that power of attorney to be a durable power of attorney, which will stay in force if you become unable to make your own decisions. A medical and or a financial power of attorney is something that you should consider. Also think about your will and your advanced directives. Many people think, well, I haven't got a great enormous inheritance. I don't know why I should do that, but it, it's a caring thing to do. Um, for your, your family, and it's something that is wisely um, thought of ahead of time rather than, than at the time that things are, things are happening. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Those are a couple of instances where we do see um, financial exploitation going on. I'm going to um, pass over now. Carrie, I believe that you are next in line to, to give us your expertise here, and, and thank you. Um, thank you all. And I hope this is helpful to you. So before before Carrie starts, just one quick question for you, Jane. Yeah. So what percentage of these types of frauds that you were showing are perpetrated by family members as opposed to somebody on the who, who's not part of the family? So I would say oh, half or more are, um, are a known um, third party. So it can be, it's not always family, it can be friends or somebody who has an affinity with the person, but it's it's a high proportion. But Bob, you know, the, the um, stranger scams are also a, a significant proportion. They really are. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead, Carrie. Sure. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Jane. Uh, with a little bit of deference to Jamie and Mark, uh, for you listening, Jane, uh, uh, Jane is the queen of prosecution in Colorado. Uh, I would not be on the wrong side of a crime with her being the prosecutor for uh, for the life of me. She does just a fabulous job. But I have accused her of avoiding me because uh, I started my career about 22 years ago at Denver, and Jane was in Boulder. And then when I moved to Jefferson County, then she moved to Denver. So um, I think she was just waiting for me to get out of the way so that she could uh, get down there, Denver, and get some really good work going. So uh, keep it up, Jane. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about scams. And when I talk about scams, uh, I'm not talking about the ones that probably uh, occur in your neighborhood or in your state, but the ones that are coming by telephone or by email, they're uh, likely coming from overseas, lots of foreign countries, Singapore, India, Nigeria, Jamaica. Um, how many of these do get prosecuted? None. Uh, we don't have jurisdictions in those countries. Once in a while, the uh, FBI has been good about going to a country like Jamaica or India. They've gone both those places and tried to work with the government. Uh, in India, they rounded up about 990 scammers. Uh, I'm sure they were replaced by the next day. So I, for myself, I've never seen a slowdown uh, as a result of any of this FBI action, it just seems that the scams keep coming hot and heavy. In fact, here are a couple of statistics. I'm not a big statistic guy, I like stories instead, but a couple of statistics. Uh, the Federal Communications Commission said that in October of 2020, 
5.1 billion scam calls came into the United States. That's a lot of calls. And their figures for 2018 showed that one out of every three calls made in the United States was a scam call. So our older adults and probably all of us uh, are being inundated uh, with these calls that come in. So my approach for a real long time, uh, and this still is basically my approach, is to try to give some you know, red flags to, uh, to look out for scams because then no matter what came down the road and how they changed, people might be a little bit better prepared to recognize them. And I'd give what I call five red flags uh, along with some common sense thing. And the common sense things uh, we know, don't, you know, don't, ever, don't talk to them. I mean, basically they get their information from conversations that they have with us. And then they build upon that. They try to build bridges and, and sources of connection with us. I always like to remind my um, older adult audiences uh, of a phrase that our mother told us when we were five years old, never talk to strangers. And that certainly is applicable for that person that's calling on the telephone or even emailing you that you have no idea uh, who they are, where they're at. So um, the, the other thing I always remind uh, older adults is you're not in trouble. The, what we call government uh, impersonation scams. Hi, we're the IRS, we're Social Security, we're the Sheriff's Department, we're your local PD. Uh, you're not in trouble, folks. Uh, most of us on the screen now, right now wish we could clone you and send you out into our counties because you're the most law-abiding people on the face of the earth, and we'd see our crime rate uh, drop drastically if there were more of you out in our jurisdiction. So you're not in trouble, and, and that call coming in that says you're in trouble uh, is just so bogus. Instead, what I want to do with the little bit of time I have now is, is focus on a couple of uh, prevention things that have come across uh, within the last couple of years. Uh, one of them, the first one I'm going to talk about, actually allows for the possibility to total, totally and completely stop scam calls. About eight years ago, the federal government held a contest. Sounds odd for the federal government. Uh, but they put out a, a notice that anyone that could come up with an application that would allow um, a smartphone to be able to tell when a call has been generated by a computer, they'd give them half a million bucks. And a couple of guys came up with this application, got the half million. Uh, the government got their, uh, their little uh, application for five years, and then it went back to them. And you know what happened as soon as it went back to them. It began to go public. They began to advertise online. Uh, a couple of other companies also came out with these uh, applications as well. So here's the deal. Scammers will buy information from an information broker here in the United States. A thousand, uh, a thousand phone numbers, maybe your email address along with that, maybe your age. They've got a little bit of information. They plug those thousand numbers into a computer and the computer begins generating calls. And when they see a connection, they jump on very quickly. They try to propagate their uh, scam with that individual. And when they're done, they go back to their computer, uh, continuing to dial up on those thump, uh, thousand numbers that they've programmed in. So scammers, I don't care what country they're in, use computers to make their calls. So now we've got an application that you can download to your smartphone that will recognize when a call coming into the phone has been generated by a computer. I don't understand the technology. I'm not an IT guy. I'll probably never understand the technology, um, but it works. And, and, and what happens is when this application recognizes the call has been generated by a computer, it blocks it. it. It doesn't even ring to your phone. And for me, that's a critical, critical key because I have talked to more older adults than I've could possibly ever cite to you this morning, who are going to talk to them for just a few minutes to keep them on the line so they couldn't bug someone else. Or they knew that they'd never fall for their, their uh, scheme because they're too smart. And all of a sudden, the scammer caught them on a bad day, a low day, a day where they're a little bit depressed, a day where family hasn't called in maybe the last week or two weeks and they're lonely. And all of a sudden, they get involved with the call, and the scammers know how to build connections. Uh, they're relational experts, really. Uh, they know how to uh, 
worm their way into the older adult's life with uh, words of affirmation, sometimes words of affection, and pretty soon they become their friend. And before you know it, because the person answered a call, they're running down the bank, getting 10,000 bucks and uh, sending that off in some manner, gift cards, wire transfer, uh, believe it or not folks, even cash. So I don't even want the calls ringing to a phone. Um, I had a lady call me one day. She said, I've gotten 25 scam calls today. You know, if, they, if we could get a hold of those people, that'd be harassment. Uh, but of course, they're not in this country. And she was just absolutely frustrated. And I know there are millions of other older adults uh, if, would like her in that same position. So I want the calls blocked. Now, I, I'm getting from a lot of folks, well, uh, I've got an application on my phone and, and a call will say spam. All right, a couple of things. First of all, it says spam after it's rung. So the call goes ahead and rings to your phone and you look down and it says spam or uh, something else. Secondly, um, on a study that you know showed how many calls were coming into the US, it was discovered that the, the scammers don't use the big three phone companies very often because they have the best mechanics at recognizing spam and portraying that to the phone. So uh, AT&T, um, uh, uh, generally, I can't even remember them. Guys, help me out here. Um, the big three aren't used very often. In fact, they've tracked that 90% of the calls that come in are routed through smaller phone companies that don't have the newest technology to identify spams and those other kinds of things that are out there to protect you. So these robotic call blockers can be a wonderful, wonderful uh, tool in stopping the call, not having it ring at all to where we kind of set off like Pavlov's dogs to, uh, to answer the call because we've been trained to do that since we were five years old. So let me tell you about a couple of them and then I'll give you uh, one, one other tip as well and I'll turn it over uh, to one of the guys. Um, there's a company called RoboKiller. Real quick this morning to make sure it was not a loop, I went to uh, the Federal Trade Commission website to see what was new. And on one of those, they were talking about RoboKiller and I said, good, the word's getting out. Uh, RoboKiller uh, will cost $6.99 a month, uh, but you can put that on four phones. That makes it a pretty good deal. Uh, RoboKiller has an application on it that I find a lot of older adults very, very interested in. And it's those older adults that say, I love to talk to the scammers just to keep them occupied for a little while. Well, I don't want you doing that, but there's an application on RoboKiller that will allow the computer to talk to the scammer. And it will actually answer the scammer's calls, except it does so in the voice of Kermit the Frog or Arnold Schwarzenegger or uh, somebody else that's uh, out there. So uh, get that application and let the computer do the talking so that you're not doing that. Uh, and plus with RoboKiller, you can get a free uh, extension that will block uh, spam or scam texts that are coming into your phone as well. So you can get the text blocked, you can get the calls blocked. Uh, the only little uh, kudo I usually add to that is um, I used to get a computer call for uh, doctor's appointments to remind me from Kaiser, so my medical provider. And I called them and I said, hey, I've got a robo blocker on my phone. And they said, great, we'll just go ahead and text you. So I don't have a device that blocks uh, scam texts because I need to get those messages some way. But uh, just an awareness that if you were get a robo call blocker, maybe uh, your doctor's call or dentist call or some other calls could get blocked on that and you're gonna need to call them and make other arrangements. Okay, robo killer. Uh, there's one called a uh, true caller. It's absolutely free. Uh, older adults like that. It hasn't got the bells and the whistles uh, that RoboKiller has, but it is free. And, and then the one that those two guys came up with and won the half a million dollars, uh, no more robo, no more robotic calls. No more robo, costs $2.99 a month. It costs less if you pay for a whole year and highly, highly effective at totally blocking and stopping scam calls. That, that's a good thing for those that don't like the ringing and those that might be tempted to say, oh, I'm just going to talk to them for fun. Uh, we don't want you talking to them for fun. Uh, we'd, like, we'd like to see these people out of business. And if we could stop their calls, perhaps uh, some of them would give up the endeavor. 
I want to encourage one other thing that uh, has a different kind of safety. Uh, I know a lot of older adults are loving getting online with their computers. Uh, I even talked to some now that are willing to go to their banks online uh, to shop online as the holiday seasons come up. And those things can be uh, uh, very, very easy and very secure. But there's a way to make them even more secure. Now, if I were to ask Jane this morning, um, what would she do if she were going to search for the best Wisconsin cheese? Uh, Jane, what would you do? I probably would. Uh, yeah, I would put in reviews. I would want cheese reviews, Wisconsin cheese reviews. Yeah, but where would you search for the best cheese? Oh, uh, where would I search? Uh, yeah. I'd I'd probably just do a Google search. Sure, ninety percent of Americans would. Because uh, 90% of Americans use Google. They have done a wonderful job marketing them. I don't use Google. I use DuckDuckGo. And the reason I use DuckDuckGo, and I'm finding uh, in my seminars at least, uh, people beginning to do this. Uh, when I come to work, I drive down I-25, I get off on I-76. And as soon as I get off, there's a huge billboard for DuckDuckGo. And there's a reason that I like DuckDuckGo. Um, there's some personal reasons, but the safety reasons are what I appreciate. First of all, DuckDuckGo makes you anonymous online. They hide your IP address. If someone were to break into your transmission, they'd have no idea where it's coming from, where it's going. It makes you completely and totally anonymous. You know, that ought to give a sense of security when you're going to your uh, online bank, uh, because there's no way for anyone to know what you're doing, uh, where you're going. Um, in addition to that, they encrypt everything. As soon as you will get online and start transmitting information or looking for information, everything on DuckDuckGo is encrypted. And so if someone broke in, uh, be next to impossible for them to be able to um, garner what the message is. The third thing I like best is it's free. While I'm talking right now, you can download it to your desktop, your laptop. Please download it to your smartphone, uh, which I refer to as a mobile computer. Uh, get it on that thing as soon as possible. The fourth reason why I like DuckDuckGo really uh, has a safety issue involved with it. And it's probably the primary reason that I talk about it. Um, let's say some of you that are out there that have grandkids. Uh, one of your grandkids wants a, a new bike for uh, the holidays and they're 10 years old. Well, that's kind of a special gift to get a 10 years old, a 10 year old. It's a, it's a little bit of bite out of my pocket, but they tell you that it's available at Target. And now you're going to be a savvy older adult and you go to the Target website. And there you see the bike that your grandchild wants. Beautiful. It's red. It's white. It's got streamers off the handlebars. It's just the coolest thing on the face of the earth. And you can already see their faces. They open that, uh, you know, at the holidays. 124 bucks. Okay, you know, you take a suck of wind and you go, well, I'm going to do it. And just before you buy that bike from Target, here comes a pop up on your computer. And that pop up has the exact same red bike for 80 bucks. And you go, oh my gosh, I just saved 44 bucks by waiting a few minutes. And so you go to the website with the the, uh, the bike for $80, and it's the exact same bike. You've got it side to side with the Target website. And so you go, can't miss. And you give them your name and your shipping address. You give them a credit card. And here comes the problem. You're not getting a bike. And you're not getting a bike because that website is a fraudulent website. The Federal Communications Commission discovered 18,600 fraudulent websites last fall. I went to about 10 of them. I don't know if the guys have searched those out. They're, they're beautiful. They look absolutely perfect and flawless. So um, you say, what's that have to do with DuckDuckGo? Well, because they don't know who you are, where the request is coming from, where the transmission is coming from, there are no pop-ups on DuckDuckGo. So there is no chance for a fake website to pop up. I don't know about you, it creeps me out. When I'm looking for a new shirt and 30 seconds later, shirts just like that start popping up on my screen. It's like someone's been looking over my shoulder and you know, you wanna go, who are you? Where are you? Well, uh, with DuckDuckGo, there are no pop-ups. And so there is a huge measure of security of avoiding those advertisements, those enticements from fake websites. Uh, I guess the last reason I like DuckDuckGo is uh, it just brings the results of my search back in a random order. 
Uh, I, I don't know about anyone else, but um, you know, James, a search for Wisconsin cheese on Google. Here's number one, here's number two, here's number three. Well, Jane, I hate to tell you, number one paid Google the most money, and number two paid Google the second most, most money to be in those places. With DuckDuckGo, you just get a random search. You can read through them, make up your own mind, uh, and decide exactly what you're looking for. So there are some new things coming out. We need to be aware, keep our ear to the ground, because these aren't going to be the last ones. And with that, I'm going to um, switch off to you, Mark. No, uh, Jamie, Jamie would be next, but uh, thank, thanks very much, Carrie. Okay, Jamie, I'm going to switch off to you. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. It, yeah, the order doesn't matter um, at all. So, so I'm Jamie Soros, and I'm with the 18th Judicial, which, uh, as mentioned, is four counties, at least until 2025. We're pretty big, about 1.4 million people. And come 2025, they're going to establish a brand new judicial district, which will be the 23rd. Currently, there's 22. And for us, the 18th will uh, stay with Arapahoe. And the 23rd will be Douglas, Albert, and Lincoln, which are um, uh, definitely with Douglas and, and Albert are counties that are, are dramatically growing. So, uh, so I wear a lot of hats here, um, just like Jane does, just like Carrie does um, in, in a district attorney's office. Um, I do receive the calls that come in, the hotline calls. Uh, if someone thinks they're a victim of consumer, uh, some type of consumer fraud, other types of financial um, uh, complaints and, and concerns and, and losses. Of course, we have a big team, just like the other offices with other prosecutors and investigators. Um, and we also work very close with other offices and other agencies, which I'll tap into in, in just a minute. Um, I'm very outward facing with our office. I'm out in public a lot. Um, like the others, do a lot of presentations, the bulk of which tend to be our, um, our senior population. But um, as I always tell folks, uh, fraud and scams, it impacts you know, every, every generation. It really does. I mean, our kiddos, the kids experience just as much as the, the seniors do. The thing is, they just don't have the money. And, and the seniors uh, tend to, to have more, so they um, often are, are more common targets. So um, but wear a lot of hats here. Uh, I just I did want to just mention a couple types of scams, and Mark's going to go into greater detail. But you know, one that um, concerns me. They all concern me. One that definitely concerns me, and I hear more and more of. People come up to me when I give a presentation. I get the calls that come in. Um, are these romance and connection scams? And um, they've been around for a long time. They'll continue. Deadly during COVID when we were isolated, people wanted to stay connected. Uh, they want to stay informed. They were lonely. But here's an interesting fact. Um, it actually came out in February. The FBI pushed it out. But it's pretty, to me, it's pretty outstanding. But it came out right before Valentine's Day. But the FBI reported, and this is just what came to them, that between October last fall, October 2021, to January of this year, so basically about four months, just in Colorado and Wyoming, which these numbers are pretty much Colorado, there's not a lot of people in Wyoming, but during October to January, over $32 million were lost um, in relation to romance um, and connection scams, just in the two states, 32 million, and over 60% of those victims we're over 60 years of age. So, so it does happen with all ages. Uh, it tends to happen a lot more um, with our senior population, but that number is pretty, pretty outstanding. And the avenues of connection initially can range. A lot of it is online. It can come through Facebook, through Messenger, someone pretending to be a friend of a friend. Uh, catfishing is another big term that, you know, that's it's out there. But the people, you know, as humans, we're always it's in us to connect, um, you know, with others, and, and, and we'd like to connect in some level or another. And sometimes these start as friendship arrangements, and then weeks and months or whatever go on, and the two people are still in touch, and it becomes something so much, so much more. Um, typically, the situations are very storybook. You know, typically it's somebody that's overseas, military, an oil rig, medical services. Uh, there's always an excuse why they can't meet. Uh, you may not even see who the person is, but this connection builds. 
Um, there's a lot of problems with this. The dollar amount can be pretty outstanding. We had someone in the Littleton community, woman over uh, over 65, uh, did the course of uh, gave out about $250,000 of her money, but also she opened up, she allowed checks to come in from this individual, her future mate, checks to come in and run through her account, which were to be deposited, the money be taken out. Of course, the checks bounced. It was about another 200000 So the two fifty dollars and the two hundred, dollars and if you don't know this, if you open up your account and run checks through, even if you think it's for good intentions or you you just don't know, if those checks bounce, the, the financial institution is going to come after you. And so these losses can be pretty significant. Um, if it's finally determined that this is was never a true relationship, and often that's the case, something that's very sad in this space right here is the suicide rate is very high. The embarrassment of the loss and then the embarrassment of what has happened. A lot of these situations, people come up and say, like, my daughter's told me not to to move further on this because this person isn't real. Law enforcement has told me not to move forward, but they still do. They still continue to talk and give out money. Um, and it's 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 unfortunate. So, so the scammers, these criminals, not only are they very effective at plucking away at the more uncomfortable emotions that we may go through as humans, you know, fear and anxiety and loneliness, like with the pandemic, um, fear of back taxes that aren't paid, they're also very good at manipulating us on those other emotions as more positive, you know, um, being in love. So that's an area that, that that definitely concerns me. I've had a lot of situations we've had to deal with. And those numbers right there are pretty, pretty significant. Um, if there's a way that I can share my screen just yes. quick, quickly. Yeah. Um, so, so I just want to, because part of the what I'm going to talk about is just how our office works with others and some things that are out there. Because like I said, Mark's, I think, is going to capitalize on some more of the, the more common types of uh, fraudulent, you know, attempts by, the, by these criminals that are here uh, and, and elsewhere. Uh, but before I do that, you know, like Carrie talked a lot, a lot does come from overseas and we have very little um control over of, of, of going after those. It's unfortunate. So we try to do the best that we can at educating you, the public, um, to look out for these red flags, what have you. But some things are here. Like during the spring and summer, we get a tremendous amount of calls, at least our office does, on homeowner contractor fraud. So these are people that just are out to solely steal money from you and provide no services and materials. Um, um, or they just they just have bad business practices and they're using your money to cover something else. And in the end, there's poor workmanship, which was not a crime, uh, but also loss of money because huge deposits are put, down, are put down in advance. So there's a lot of in-person as well. Um, so anyway, so so we all do kind of work together. What Mark talks about, what Jane talks about, what Carrie talks about. Um, the Better Business Bureau, other organizations. I mean, we are kind of saying the same thing. We're hearing the same types of stories. Um, we're all human at the end of the day. And we have our, our strengths and, and weaknesses there. Uh, but we do try to put together a lot of different programs for the community in partnership together or just our individual offices. This is something that um, we put on back in the spring. We have a senior law and safety summit, kind of a big deal. That's at the Charles Schwab campus. It's an all-day event. They have a lot of different speakers kind of come in and talk um, in that senior space from probate attorneys um, to living will to, to the consumer fraud side to just basic safety, common sense, to health-related issues uh, like dementia. Um, because, you know, since a big part of the population is seen this getting ahead, these criminals know there's a high percentage of individuals that may be beginning to have cognitive decline, and they're going to take full advantage of that individual that's in that position. It's it's heartbreaking. Um, these people are heartless, and but their goal is to um, extract money or information out of you. But so we put this program on. What I love about this, and and I think other, um, I think Jeffco has done it as well, something like this in the past, and I think Denver may have. But what's great about it is, is like the steering committee that 
um, we put together. Mark was on from AARP. We had someone from the Better Business Bureau on the steering committee. We had the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office, the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, Castle Rock Police Department. And so we had a dynamic team getting unique speakers to come in and talk about all these different law-related topics, which you see here in fraud prevention and crime prevention and safety. It's a great opportunity to, um, to learn a lot and to know who the players are out there that are trying to educate the community and protect everybody. And something that comes out, out of that, it's, though it's not our publication, um, and a, uh, but something that's given out to everybody, another great resource, is the, uh, is the Colorado Senior Law Handbook, which comes out every two years. And so we give this out to folks. This is something, uh, next version is coming out in 2023. We just revamped our little section in there. But for the state of Colorado and our senior population, it's just a wealth of information um, and a very broad uh, array of, of categories from government programs, the veterans benefits to estate planning, reverse mortgages, the like. But you can find this, if you don't know about this, you can actually download it online by going to the seniorlawhandbook.org or you go to the Colorado Bar Association's website, which is cobar, C-O-B-A-R, Dot org, but you can go there and download this. I just recommend it for, for the caregivers, for the Gen X that are taking care of parents. Um, it's a great resource. Um, but with this event, I should, like, as I mentioned, it, it's a lot of different groups coming together in our district. We pulled in the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, Lone Tree, Arapahoe County, uh, our district attorney, John Callender for the 18th, taught. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful event. This is something that we kind of shared, and I, it's, I think it's worth sharing here. It was a couple of slides from the event. These are also some numbers that kind of came up from the FBI. So once again, these are numbers that are coming from them. There's other groups like the Federal Trade Commission and what have you that also have additional numbers. But Colorado is now ranked number eight in the number of reported consumer fraud crimes in 2021 for folks over age 60. Colorado. The states that were before us or are before us are listed below. And these are very, those are very populated states, except maybe Nevada, but California, Florida, Texas, New York, Ohio, Nevada, Pennsylvania, we're number eight. We're number eight right there. Um, we also have a very high senior population here. Um, in fact, we are the second fastest in growth in terms of older adults. It doesn't mean that we have more than say California or Pennsylvania or Florida, but those people that are now crossing over age 65 or that are moving here, we're second behind Nevada. So, so because of that in the outside, outside of the state and US borders, they know that. And so, so we have a lot of numbers of complaints coming in to, to the Denver office and to, to Jeffco and maybe ARP and our own office. We just have a very fast growing population. Douglas County is a very silver county. Uh, the number of individuals there that are over 65 is, is very, very high. So if you don't know, and maybe uh, Bob has covered this in previous topics, but so why, do the senior, why does the senior population get hit as much as it does? Well, some of the reasons are is they tend to have, but not always, a higher level of discretionary income and assets. Many individuals are retired and often at home, and the criminals know that. Many older individuals may not understand new technology. One of the few good things about COVID is I think a lot of people that did not embrace technology previously did during COVID because we were isolated and we wanted to be educated, stay educated and connected. But do a lot of individuals in this age group understand? No, they don't. Um, and they'll take advantage of that. This generation tends to be more trusting, has a higher degree of respect for authority. Very, very, very true. Definitely much more than my kids. And of course, <laughs> part of that's my fault and their upbringing, but, 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 but the senior population does have a higher degree of respect. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of individuals in this group um, are facing uh, cognitive changes. And um, and these criminals will, you know, they'll take full advantage. The stories that I've, that have been shared with me, the video content that I've listened to, um, 
where I'm hearing the criminals have conversations, these seniors and what they're forcing them to do and hear the individuals breaking down and crying. I don't have any money. I only have a small amount of assets out of that, just social security. And the criminals are just still trying to siphon every little bit of uh, financial, uh, the assets that the, uh, the senior may have. It's, it's heartbreaking. Um, so anyway, so I kind of digress there, but those are stuff that we shared at, at, at that senior law day. And it's stuff that other people that spoke there, like from the attorney general's office and, and these other probate lawyers and the sheriff's office and that things that were shared as well. So our office, I think very similar to Jeffco and in, in Denver, you know, we, we, in addressing this, you know, we, we do have our economic crime unit for the, the, the financial exploitation. And then when there's tends to bleed more into the physical space for elder abuse, we have a special victims unit. So we have a whole nother team there. The key age in 70, I mean, in Colorado where things tend to change and become very elevated, if you don't know, is a person that is over 70 years of age. So when in this space, this activity occurs, the penalties can be much, are much more um, stringent. Um, on the people that are committing committing the crimes. And also those individuals, regardless of age, if they have a mental or physical you know, disability. So um, that's part of how we're made up and a lot of other law enforcement or the DA's offices uh, here in the state and we will prosecute as best we can accordingly. Um, but it also always starts with people reporting the physical harm and people reporting the fraud. And the senior population is the least likely to report these incidents for reasons that I covered before out of embarrassment, fear of uh, repercussions um, uh, from maybe other family members or what have you. When I go out and talk to folks um, in person, they love to share their stories, which is great because I'd rather person in the chair over here, hear someone's story in the chair over here than from me. I think it resonates much better. But then when I ask them if they actually reported it to law enforcement, typically the answer is no. And if I ask them why, it's for reasons that I've already already mentioned. Um, but once again, in partnership, we we do, we work with all these different groups. We, we, we do try to educate, we try to engage folks, we try to put out all of our offices do online and in paper. We try to put out these advisories, like here's one on gift card um, fraud and scams. We put out ones on homeowner contractor. We put out ones on this is government imposter fraud, but it's really types of imposter fraud. Uh, we try to put these out. We try to empower individuals together. I do a lot of presentations with the sheriff's offices where we go and talk about online safety and just uh, common sense. Um, for example, not being on your cell phone at a stoplight or a stop sign because you leave yourself extremely vulnerable for someone to come up and abduct you and or your car or something similar. So we do what we can. And we're trying to always trying to find ways for information to resonate um, uh, better. I think and I, this group, I think, Bob, you're already doing this. I think a key is that middle generation, someone that has parents that are seniors, but also parents to, uh, to minors, those that are younger. I think from a generational standpoint, if they can work together and help with the checks and balances and make sure that the younger and the older generation is up to speed with um, being current on the software and understanding, like for an iPhone, when it says it's time to, that there's a... Um, um, a new um, enhancement uh, on the system. I think it's important for people to know they need to move on that, not only for the improvement of the features on the phone, but more so they have the most current security measures in place on their device. Um, doing kind of a checklist with, you know, with, with our parents to make sure that they are changing their passwords regularly and they know how to do that and save them. Um, I strongly, when I go out and talk to folks, I always start on the behavioral side because there's so much that an individual can do to protect themselves. And it really comes down to a breakdown or a, in human behavior and human weaknesses. It's when, because the criminals are very good at what they do, it's, it's understanding when it comes to making a decision, which is what's happening here when these calls come in and these texts and emails, 
um, you have to make a decision to do or not to do. So I, I, I do, I talk about that behavioral thinking in the past when there were moments of regret where they took more of a reactionary approach versus being more responsive and sitting back and assessing the landscape and going to the Colorado uh, Secretary of State's website, for example, to make sure that this organization is even legitimate, that it, it that it even exists, that asking your daughter, or your, your family member, does this make sense? Um, but all of us are trying to, to, to educate the public to do things like this and to work together as a family unit, but also the groups that they're associated with and, 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 and taking full advantage of what AARP puts out there and the DA's offices and the Federal Trade Commission has a wealth of information of things. Um, even the credit bureaus, if you, if you sign up for their apps, the amount of information, educational content they push out is tremendous, but we are all saying kind of the same thing. Um, another effort just to let you know things that um, law enforcement and, and a DA's office and, and the police and sheriff's departments are in that as well. Here's something we did uh, not too far back and, and looking to still do this in Arapo County. This was Douglas County. We partnered with the big real re retailer, which was Safeway Albertson, same company, which sounds like is now going to be part of Kroger. But anyway, big public um, PR event. We had it at a Safeway and, and gift cards are one of the biggest areas um, that criminals are trying to get people to make payments. Even when it doesn't make sense, they're telling people to go get gift cards, easy way to wash money. It's hard to bring back. If you've given those numbers out, you're, you're pretty much have lost that money. But here's in a situation where the signage has been greatly increased at the gift card stands, where there's actually questions there where hopefully the people can ask themselves to determine if they're in the process of being scammed because the IRS just said, you have 2,500 in back payments do to avoid an armed marshal showing up at your door today to arrest you, go get these gift cards. These are questions that hopefully people ask and realize that they're in the process of trying to be scammed by purchasing these gift cards. So the signage has increased and there's even signage there with the local law enforcement entity with a number if they feel as though they're being um, caught up in this, there's a number that they can go ahead and call law enforcement then and there at the store, whether it be the Lone Tree Police Department or the Douglas County Sheriff's Office or something like that. So we're all, these are more, pro, these are additional programs that we're, we're trying to put out there to, you know, uh, help them, you know, help the public. Uh, such great information shared by all my colleagues from the DA's offices, really appreciate it. And uh, I learned a couple of things too. So I love learning new things every day. And again, I appreciate uh, hearing all of your insight from the DA's offices. Um, so AARP Elder Watch, for those who are not familiar, is a partnership between AARP and the Colorado Attorney General's Office. It's been going on for uh, 21 years now. And we really do education outreach across the state, as well as have uh, volunteer staff call centers. And so um, in our office, we have a in, that services Colorado. We have an Elder Watch helpline, and but we also manage the National Fraud Watch Network helpline out of our office as well. Um, you know, we're taking upwards of uh, seven to 10,000 uh, calls a month um, from, from Colorado, obviously, mostly on the Elder Watch helpline, but also on the Fraud Watch Network helpline uh, and, and from across the country. And so we have about um, uh, 100 volunteers um, nationwide who are the ones who are helping kind of the victims of frauds and scams and are also taking reports um, directly. A lot of the information that we gather from the people who are calling um, educates what we do in terms of our education outreach, uh, both in Colorado and then on a national scale. Um, most of the time, um, any ARP bulletin articles, if you're an ARP member, um, those, those um, articles are being sourced right out of our office from people who are calling and reporting the different frauds and scams that they're experiencing. Um, and so it's a great way to help educate folks, uh, you know, really based upon the real life story that are happening from uh, AARP members and other folks who are reporting directly to AARP. We're taking over 100,000 calls a year right now um, in terms of, of the different frauds and scams that are re being reported to AARP, AARP. And about a third of those that are being reported to us are the ones that are handled by the volunteers and they're the escalated calls that are deemed a victim of a fraud or a scam. Uh, meaning that they either gave money or personal information as part of one of these um, kind of, you know, scam phone call or, or uh, interaction on the web. 
So I just wanted to go over real quick um, some of the most common scams that are being reported uh, in Colorado. So I ran the numbers uh, from what has been reported uh, both through the Elder Watch Helpline and the Fraud Watch Network Helpline from Colorado residents. And I'll say that now, when I look at national data versus uh, what, what's being reported um, just here in Colorado, they're very similar, uh, but I just want to just touch on a couple of them that, that we're really seeing different trends on. And so the imposter business scam has been number one this year, and but no shock of anyone, I'm sure many people on today's call have gotten some type of imposter business scam uh, regarding uh, some, saying that with Amazon. Identity theft has been a consistent issue that we've been dealing with, especially uh, after all of the unemployment insurance fraud uh, that we heard about over the last couple of years. And so we're still seeing some backlash from that in terms, and we know it was a major problem in Colorado, but in every other state as well. Um, the tech support and computer virus scams have taken different tacks uh, so far over the last a year or so, and instead of just saying that they're with Windows and Microsoft and, and Apple, uh, folks were also saying, you know, getting invoices from Norton and McAfee. I know that sometimes I look in my spam folder and I see 10 different invoices from Norton or McAfee in there. And so I know if I'm getting them, other folks are getting them, but we are seeing lots of uh, folks who um, are, are being victimized by that type of a scam because they might be a customer and, and are concerned that their uh, virus virus uh, protection software is flying up. Um, as we mentioned before, we're, you know, and I know that a lot of DA's offices get these calls in terms of home repair and improvement scams, but again, people are uh, funneling those, those calls sometimes to the Attorney General's office and our office as well. Um, and Jamie talked a lot about the online dating and romance scams uh, that we're hearing about a lot. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, if you ask our volunteers, what are the most difficult kind of calls they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the loved ones who are trying to convince uh, their, their family member or their friend that they are involved in a romance scam. And so some of those are terrible. And, you know, another kind of attack we're seeing with those recently, uh, more so recently, is blackmail scams where, you know, someone might be sharing images uh, that they shouldn't be or videos that they shouldn't be. And then, you know, they're saying, I'm going to share those images with all your friends or family if you don't send me money. And so you know, lots of people get, and, and I know Jamie had um, mentioned suicide as well. We're seeing uh, also uh, suicide issues specifically with those blackmail scams of people of all ages, again, not just older adults. Um, if we looked at this list five years ago or seven years ago when I started doing this work, the imposter government scams were always number one. Uh, and those are usually the IRS or social security imposter scams. Um, they kind of evolved and changed over time, but we still do see them bubble up from time to time, and they, they do exist out there. Fraudulent sales, I know Carrie talked about fake websites, and I think it's fake websites are one of the things that are really, really um, hitting on some of the, uh, you know, puppy scams we're seeing a lot of, especially during COVID. Um, but again, different types of products. I've even been kind of sucked in based on advertisements on Instagram, um, to some products that I think uh, is probably too good to be true, but I also just want to give it a shot. So, <laughs> um, so that's where I'm at with that. Uh, it was that paddleboard that did it to me. But I was I took the proper precautions at the stand up paddleboard. I took the the proper precautions and I you know marked on my calendar the the date that I needed to get back to my credit card that type of a thing. And sure enough, I never received it. But uh, learned a valuable lesson and and also kind of knew deep down it was probably. Uh, sweepstakes, present lottery scams consistently being reported to our office. I, I wish this, again, was a scam that would go away. Um, it used to kind of fall higher up on our list, but again, anytime you have to pay money to receive money, it's always a scam. Um, again, Publishers Clearinghouse is the name that continues to uh, kind of reverberate around this scam, though I just saw one that came into our office today saying there was there with Reader's Digest. Um, phishing scams, as well, you know, lots of different ways of phishing. We're seeing more text messages that are phishing than probably ever before. And I think it's really important that folks are watching out for those text messages and only responding to people who they know. And of course, Jane talked about the, the non-stranger exploitation that we do get reported and, and we're usually um, kind of farming those out to APS workers um, across the state when we're getting those types of calls. Just a couple of quick trends that I wanna go over as well and, and some of the, uh, things that we're really seeing, especially in 2022, um, cryptocurrency has been, you know, even uh, 
it might be right now as big as gift cards in terms of the types of scams and the, and the payment methods that we're hearing people ask for. And so when we're talking about payment methods, it's a really good way of identifying red flags of scams and knowing that cryptocurrency, you know, again, IRS, you know, different types of businesses are not asking for payment and legitimate businesses are asking payment, payment in cryptocurrency. And I think cryptocurrency has grown quite a bit because it's more accessible to people and people are more familiar with it now. Um, again, it's not widely understood, but people might be wanting to dabble in it. Um, there is lots of buzz around it as well, but but knowing the accessibility in terms of going to the grocery store now or going to a gas station and seeing Bitcoin ATMs and different types of crypto ATMs, whether it be a Coinstar machine or something else, um, it's ready, readily available and scammers know that, that, again, most people don't understand it. And so they'll just send them to one of these kiosks with a chunk of money and they'll be entering it, not knowing what they're doing necessarily. But we're seeing that more and more. Also investment scams around cryptocurrency have been really huge right now as well. Peer-to-peer -peer payment apps, again, scammers are looking for the quickest and easiest ways to get money. Again, people very much like crypto, people are much more familiar now with, with apps like Venmo, Zelle and Cash App. And so we're seeing many more scammers asking for these um, really quick ways of transferring money. Because, again, scammer, the person doesn't even have to go to the grocery store to buy that gift card or even go to the kiosk to insert that cryptocurrency um, they, or money to make it into cryptocurrency. They can just sit on their phone and do it. And so, again, we're seeing scammers instructing people to download Zelle or Cash App or Venmo so they can make those quick transfers of money that, again, is very much like a wire transfer and gone. Again, we're still seeing gift cards, and, it, and it's... But I would just say that these other ones are starting to kind of level out with the amount of gift card requests that we're seeing. And, and also accessing bank accounts directly uh, is something that I'd say that, you know, especially with tech support scams, scammers are becoming just, they're not, they're not settling for the $399 payment um, that, that, that might come with a tech support scam these days. They're actually just wanting to um, access your computer so that once they're on their computer, they want to access your bank account. And that is, that's kind of where we're at in this world. They want all your money. They don't want the 399 and then get to go to the next guy. They're looking, uh, you know, they're going straight for the jugular. And it's, it's a really, really um, scary kind of situation, uh, in, especially once people are engaged with these folks. So payment methods, really important um, red flags and ways of identifying red flags in terms of the different types of scams. Also communication methods. I mentioned text messages. You know, more people don't trust their email and they don't, don't trust those phone calls. So the scammers are going to text messages and they are, um, you know, sending out texts that look very, very real in, in a lot of occasions, saying that they're with a the business um, like a UPS or a FedEx or they're with a the bank, um, seeing lots of people get in trouble, saying that, oh, we've seen a, you know, a wrong um, charge on your Chase account. And so you need to uh, give us a call at this number and we're gonna help take care of it. And then all of a sudden they're in a, in a scam that, that involves their bank account and, and other types of things. So watching out for that is really important and, and managing your text messages like you manage your phones and your email is critical and critically important. Um, social media scams, you know, it's, it's a hotbed for scammers. You know, so many of the scams that we're seeing, government grant scams, especially right now, all coming in on Facebook. And so really important to know that there's bad actors out there on social media and, you know, including Facebook and Instagram and that, you know, scammers are, are lurking there just as much as anyone. And so many nice people um, want to believe that the person they're talking to is a real person, but in reality, um, it's someone just posing as anyone who they want to be. Now, again, better phishing emails than I've seen before. And, you know, I think it's really important to remember that apps with any type of social component, like Carrie said before, and mentioned, and I think it's so important that, you know, all these devices are computers, you know, your smartphone, your tablet, uh, your laptop, your desktop, they're all computers. And, and again, scammers aren't going to, um, you know, they're not, they're, they don't care what kind of device it is. If you have a browser on it, they can take over that browser or be a part of that browser. And I think that it's really important that people um, remember that. And, and that also that any other kind of app you're working on that has a social component, like Words with Friends, or even gambling apps, or different types of gaming apps that you're on, where you can talk to one another, there's a very good chance that the person on the other end who's trying to 
converse with you is this camera. I remember doing one presentation, this was a couple of years ago, where three different women were talking about three different friends of theirs who had in, all been involved in romance type relationships um, through words with friends. And they were all playing with doctors who they thought were, you know, sexy guys who want to just be, you know, be their next date. And it was, it was um, definitely not the case because they all ended up being um, victimized by these, by these very smooth talking people who were on the apps. So again, watch out for places where there are social components, there are scams out there, um, deal with that. Um, I'm not going to go through these. This is kind of my laundry list of ways to avoid scams that I, in, that I uh, include with every one of my presentations, but, but, you know, if you follow this list, you won't be victimized by a scam. <laughs> but we should answer questions, and and um, I, I, again, thank you for all your time. Anybody in the audience uh, have a question for any of our presenters? You know, Bob, I don't have a question, but I see some new names on this webinar, and I think we should know one of the reasons, among many, that AgeWise was created um, we vet our providers. So if you go to our website to find someone to help you or help a loved one, um, you know they've gone through a process. We check with the Secretary of State. We check with all the regulatory agencies about licensing. Um, we check with the network of people we know in the senior world. Um, that doesn't give a 100% guarantee. One never knows. Uh, people do change, but we'll, we do our best to make sure that everyone on our website are, are honest, legitimate businesses, be they a nonprofit or a for-profit. We don't check the governmental ed agencies. We check in with them differently. <laughs> thanks, thanks again, Barbara. The, um, I had a, a question that came to me the other day from someone who, who said they couldn't be on the call today. Um, who was very concerned about, about the fact that somebody managed to squeeze her birth date out of her. Um, so what does someone do with a birth date and a name? A scammer, that is. I'll fall, I'll, I'll fall on that sword. Um, <laughs> so honestly, I think, you know, one of the one of the recommendations that I that I give when I'm doing presentations for folks in uh, the community is to is to take a moment and Google yourself and understand um, what information is out there readily about about you and and what you could reasonably believe that someone could find. And so I can guarantee you, if you Google me right now, you can find out my birthday. Um, and I think people are concerned about birthdays because when you associate them with other bits of information, um, there is potential for a little bit of danger. Uh, but as a general rule, I, I can't get too worked up about, um, and, and folks, the other panelists might have a, have, a have a disagreement with me about this, but I can't get too worked up about things that are, kind of, that are more or less public record, because you, if you do certain searches, you can find that information pretty easily. I, I know I was doing, my grandparents have been dead for over 20 years, but I was doing searches on my grandparents just to see what was out there, and I could easily find their social security numbers um, and, and other types of information that were all part of public record. And so, again, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, birthdays um, concern me way less than the numbers, um, financial numbers, healthcare numbers, um, and other types of kind of personal identifying information uh, such as that. But others might have a different opinion. <laughs> Well, so it, 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 it's interesting, you know, like your social security number is worth about a dollar. But if I have that, I can do a lot of damage to you. And what a lot of people don't know is, is the number of breaches and hacks out there is actually pretty high. Um, it's tremendous. And so there's a lot of all of us out there. And, um, and we will all trip at some point or, you know, or, or another some degree. But um, but it's knowing how to, like I said, you know, understand yourself when you're confronted with one of these calls or texts or emails, because there is that information out there. They're just trying to get more, right? An area that really scares me, and a lot of people don't know this, is um, about 45% of children before they're 18 have an established credit file. No one's looking at their social security number. Um, 
So they go, they turn 18, they're about to enter the workforce or they're about to go to college and they get their first credit card or a car loan or something like that. And they find that they have horrible credit because lines of credit and other things have been established in their name. Um, some of that is due to breaches, um, information's out there. A lot of it is also kind of like what Jane was talking about earlier is someone known like a family member that has taken that social security number and used it for their own benefit. All three credit bureaus actually recommend by the time a kid is 15 or definitely 16, check and see if they have established credit report. If they don't, great. But what they suggest is go ahead and open up an account with that child and then freeze credit. So it puts a jacket over it so no additional um, types of credit or accounts can be opened under it. But that's pretty horrifying. Mark just said, you know, his, his grandparents have been deceased for a while, but there's a lot of information out there. So, so criminals will pick up on some of this information and they can do things. But as we've all said, if you stay current and check in your credit reports, if you if you get one of the apps for Experian or one of the others, I mean, it's real time. You're always knowing you're not getting charged. You're checking your financial um, accounts and making sure everything's legitimate. Um, you're using credit cards at a gas pump versus a debit card, the simple little things. You can kind of stay on top of all this, checking to make sure that your title is where it should be. Um, so a lot of it does kind of fall back on us and we can feel empowered to, 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 to stay current. But um, like I said, there's a lot of us out there and the criminals know that, um, but we, we can protect ourselves and there are ways to be protected um, from a reactionary standpoint as well, but better be proactive than reactionary. Well, and I like Jamie's uh, suggestion of Googling yourself, probably sounds ridiculous if you've never done it. Um, but it's kind of a wake-up call for older adults as to how much of their information is available online, way more than they think. So uh, the crooks use this information, uh, Bob, to, uh, to build a bridge of friendship when they make these calls. Uh, oh, hi, June. I see that your birthday was last month uh, because they've got your birth date. They know how old you are. And anything that begins to build um, some sense of greater trust or familiarity between uh, the, the uh, scammer making the call and, and their victim. So information's out there. We need to be very, very cautious. Well, one of the first things I do every day myself is I look at my bank account and my credit card uh, company to see if there have been any charges made that I didn't authorize. And um, it just so happened uh, about three or four months ago, there was one. So immediately called the credit card company and canceled the credit card and got a new one. So, <clears throat> and also keep in mind what you're putting out there. We, a lot of us are on social media. Um, our kids think they're tougher than they are um, when it comes to technology, but, but the amount of information that's shared, I mean, think about Facebook. Let's say you're a grandparent, you have a new grandchild. You're proud of that. It's a great moment. You start posting pictures. Suddenly there's a little Johnny on the floor and then up above there's a diploma from University of Colorado and there's a picture of a family of five. Um, people that get divorced, some people are pretty verbal about it and they just put stuff online. Um, you renovate your house, pretty proud of it, sunk a lot of money into it and you're showing all these different pictures. Well, okay, I see there's three windows in this room, right? And there's a doorway there and so just, I'm not saying stay away from social media. And even if you put the, the safeguards in place, there's ways around it, but you just need to think about what you're putting out there, which allows somebody to strike at the conversation like what Carrie just said, because um, they know something about you. Because synthetic IDs are something that happen a lot where it's a lot of you, but it's a lot a part that's not you and a new synthetic identification is created. And then it can be used to open up lines of credit and do other things. So a lot does fall back on us as yeah. individuals. Yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. I, I, I can just picture these people sitting around in a room coming up with new ideas for, for scams. <laughs> you know? yeah. They're so good at it. <clears throat> well, um, you, yep. Any other questions from uh, any of our attendees today? Um, there's a lot of information that's been put into the chat today, so uh, we'll be sure to send the uh, the chat record 
to everyone who registered for this, as well as. I, um, I do ahead. have a quick question. Yes. Um, so I actually heard of the scam where, you know, these scammers are calling and, uh, you know, saying your your loved one or child's in jail, you need money for, you know, bail or something like that. Um, I guess this pertains to all scams, but are there things we can look out for, like clues or hints at what they say to kind of know it's a scam? A lot of it. Easy one, and then I'll let Jamie come to my comprehensive answer. So often I've talked to an older adult, and they'll, they'll say, I got scammed, you know, that, uh, that my uh, grandchild was in jail. And, and then the next thing they'll say to me is, you know, about 15 minutes later, it dawned on me that maybe I should call their cell phone. Because I got to tell you, the cell phone of your grandchild is flipped to their ear, without a doubt. And they call me, yeah, I'm at school, Grandpa, I've been here all day. But, you know, when they tell you that a grandchild's in jail, we get an adrenaline rush. That adrenaline rush turns off our best thinking, and uh, we're off to the races trying to solve that problem. Sometimes it's an issue of just slowing down and thinking through what's being presented to you. And that's just it. It's, it, it's exactly it. Is, um, the flags are usually pretty obvious. I mean, at the end of the day, think about it. Their business model, they're looking to do two things. They're looking to extract personal and sensitive information out of you right now for either short or long-term financial gain, or they're trying to extract money out of you right now. So whether it's a lottery, a grandparent, a sweepstakes, a romance, it's really kind of all the same. Um, the contractor stuff, that's a little bit different. I mean, that's... Um, that's not these phishing calls that we're getting, but at the end of the day, that's their goal. And they're so good in marketing. They're so good in sales. They're so good in software engineering. That's a constant battle. Um, but rarely, rarely is anything super urgent that has to be addressed today to get that email and that call at 445 on a Friday that you have to act now, or there's a warrant out for your address. Um, it's just taking, yeah, like Carrie said, you step back, you assess the landscape, you ask, you do your research. That's the best thing you can do. Because the thing is, if you stop listening to them and you don't do what they want you to do, their tone will change and they will get aggressive. I mean, I've listened to recordings, these romance that have been going on for months. And then suddenly the victim pushes back. And this loving person on the other side that has been wonderful and has listened and understands begets irate and starts threatening. And I will take everything you have and I will do this and I will do that. I mean, in the snap of a finger. So often one of the best defenses is, is to slow down, you know, um, and drive the bus. You do the research, you ask. Um, because they'll move on, you know, you do that, you push back, they'll move on to somebody else. So, yeah. Excellent advice. Well, uh, well, folks, thank you very much. All, all uh, four of our panelists today, and uh, they all put their contact information into the chat too. So if you want to reach out to them with other questions or comments later, you can do that. Um, and and uh, as always, we always appreciate any feedback that you can give us about the webinars that we do. You know, did you get value from them? Are there are other things that you would like to hear about in the future, that kind of stuff but is always helpful to us. So once again, thank you all and, um, and everybody <laughs> have, a, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, enjoy. And don't, don't answer those nasty calls. <laughs> okay, all right, take care folks, all right.